first. Hello, everyone. Good evening, good afternoon, whatever it is for you. Good morning. Just woke up. <coughs> um, thank you for coming to this event hosted by the Eastern Clinic Program, the Turkish Student Association here at Syracuse University. The Turkish Student Association hosts a multiplicity of events from panels and speakers like the one that you're going to hear today, um, to cultural events, particularly culture and Club, which has lots of good food. So the table that has the best food is always the Turkish Student Association. You go there, okay? Uh, today we're going to hear from Professor Edward Erickson. He wrote the book of the command of the fire, which is for sale outside $20. Um, in the bookstore, you can pay with a credit card, with debit card, even cash, if we prefer the credit card. Um, these will be up for sale outside after the lecture. <laughs> Professor Edward Erickson is a retired U.S. Army officer. He has served in the Persian Gulf, in Turkey, he's been on military NATO campaigns in Italy. Bosnia and Herzegovina, the most beautiful country in the world, of course, I'm not biased at all, being born there, um, and Iran. He is now a military, um, a, actually, professor at the Military Marine Corps University, right? Um, and he is here to discuss his book today. Um, afterwards, we're going to have a question and answer period. Please feel free to have cookies, refreshments, get up now before we start. Um, and then we can also have a link here. Can we have the young gentleman in the back please come towards the front? We have to leave early, that's fine. Oh, okay. Okay, so we don't have no gift to leave early. <laughs> All right. Uh, I will allow to talk. Thank you. Well, let me express my gratitude to the Turkish Students Association for inviting me. Um, I, any opportunity for me to talk about my work and what I do is, is a good thing for me. Um, <clears throat> the question earlier, how, how do you start with the Ottomans <laughs> and the Turks? I, I, was, I was a captain in the Army. I was an ROTC instructor at the same Orange University in Canton. And I was coming to the end of my tour, and I was on orders for the 82nd Airborne Division. And I'd always had a language school as a, as a, a, a preference. I knew mean, I mean, where to go was. The branch manager called me and he said, yeah, I'm sending you to language school. Your next assignment, uh, you, can, you can have Greek, Korean, or Turkish, and they start April, May, and June. And I said, well, I really want to spend a day here commissioning the cadets and soon graduate, so I'll take the one in June. What did you say it was again, Turkish? And that's how I got the language school, and from there to Turkey, and then to Germany, back to Turkey, to the States, back to Turkey, and so that was multiple, multiple times in the army. Um, and that's my story. Uh, it, the, the Ottomans, the, 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 the Turks, uh, were a peripheral part of history for me. I was a mainstream European World War I, World War II, Germans, French, and British guy. And going to Turkey gave me the opportunity to, to see a, a different view of that war. So that, that's how I got started. Um, it's the 22nd of April, <clears throat> Anzac Day. There's the 25th. So, Saturday is Anzac Day in Australia and New Zealand. And were you to go to the Gallipoli Peninsula this year, it's the centenary of the Anzac, the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps landing. It's a big deal. There'll be thousands and thousands of people, prime ministers, are going there. Uh, you can't book a hotel room in the book for five years. And, and every year, every year, you go there. at Anzac Beach. And it's a very emotional thing for, for most Australians and New Zealanders. So we're very close to the centenary. Okay. Um, you don't know much about the levels of warfare like I do. I'm not only a military historian, but I'm a practitioner of military arts. I'm in the Army in the field artillery. There's the tactical level, which is, is battles small actions. There is the strategic level, which is the national priority of effort, marshaling those resources. And in the middle is the, this thing called the operational level of war. It's all about campaigns. So what I write about, my focus is on military campaigns. A campaign is a series of battles and actions that achieves a strategic result. So my level of war links the tactical battles to the strategic 
most of you have probably never been to the Dallas, and most of you have probably never even thought about it. Um, in America, it's, it's a, it's a little-known campaign, except with a few specialists like myself. If you were going to England, it's a huge deal. Same thing in Australia, same thing in Turkey. Uh, so I'll talk about the myths of history, then go through the, the, the three campaigns. At the strategic level, it's a single campaign, nine months. At the operational level, it's three campaigns. And there are three different ways of, of trying to break through the dark mills. Uh, then I'll talk about the major points in my thesis and the book, and how it, it changes the, the historical narrative somewhat. And then we'll do question and answer. It should take about 45, 50 minutes if I can talk. Sorry, we have just been like, let me try taking a lot. I'll try my own. Um, there's a hundred year historiography of this thing. The historiography is, is the history of history. We think differently today about Lincoln's cabinet, the cabinet of rivals, it's called, because of one book that came out about, about five years ago than we ever did before. So history changes all the time. The history of Gallipoli is changing. It's in its fourth narrative generation after a hundred years. It's packed full of mythology like this. That the British should have won. They made just made too many mistakes. The German commanders and, and help from the Germans were instrumental in, in winning this battle. That the Turks were, were clumsy. They, 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 just, they were clumsy uh, and just happened to win because there, there were too many. Uh, Mustafa Kemal, <clears throat> the great Turkish legend. That, Take him out of out of this equation, and they fail. Not true. Probably not true. A great man, a great tactical leader at this point in his career, but but there are a number of other people who are as, as good as he was at this particular point. Nobody in Turkey in 1915 knows who this guy is. It was until 1916, a year later, they start to tell his story. This mythology is ethnocentric. It's it's dar it's social Darwinism. It's all, it's all from a, a Western British narrative that focuses on explaining the British defeat. So it's an apology for, for a British defeat. People like me aim to change this. Okay, how does it start? There are these people, these powerful personalities. This is kind of like Bush and Rumsfeld and Condoleezza Rice in 2003, and they get going with it, and Churchill is, 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 is the man of the moment. Uh, there are other personalities, Jackie Fisher, the war personal of the Admiralty, um, Kitchener, the Secretary of State for the War. And they're contentious, and they're always arguing, and they're bickering about what to do and how to win this war. So this is a committee system at war. A committee uh, has never worked well, especially in the war. A camel is a horse built by a committee. So those are the kind of people that they get this thing going. What happens? They're proud. The Western Front still in. Trenches have, have set in. They're still in the Western Front. And we've got some surplus capacity. We've got extra battleships, holdings, to be sure that they're still, they're still militarily useful. We've got a few extra soldiers sprinkled in. We can't really send them to France because things won't change. There aren't enough of them to tip the balance. So we have surplus capacity in a lot of ships. And where can we put them? And they have this thing. They have a lot of ideas. They're called schemes. All those arrows are places that one or two of those people I just showed you argue to put British soldiers in, in harm's way. Up in the Baltic, Jackson Fisher wants to invade Pomerania and seize Berlin. It's crazy. Uh, there are schemes to put, put uh, British soldiers in the Adriatic to aid Serbia, which is under attack by, by the, the austro hungarians so there are all these places that they argue about for a couple months before they finally come to this idea that they'll, they'll hit Turkey. There are a lot of assumptions. Assumptions are where military plans always go. We know military plans don't survive first contact. Um, in, in 2003 in Iraq, our assumption is that, that after we take Baghdad and we seize the country, that expatriates will come in and set up a government and the United States can go home. So that, that was a bad assumption. And, and, and after all we put in this time, we still have a problem with Iran. These are the flawed British assumptions. Um, that they can leverage sea power. That, that they, they have a, that they're greatly superior to the Ottomans. This is a social Darwin kind of a, a thing. 
but the Tao Empire is politically fragile. It won't take much to fissure or crack or rupture it, and it will fall apart in the version of walking and occupying Constantinople. They think this can be done on the cheap with just secondary forces, a few resources, and they'll get a high return on investment. They think it'll go fast. And so there's all this thing. Um, and it'll be quick, and it'll be decisive, and it'll get in and out quickly at a low cost. So every one of these assumptions will break down under the pressure of the campaign as it, as it, as it evolves. There you are. The Turks call this the Chanakali Salash. We call it the Gallipoli campaign. Gallipoli actually is a city kind of on, on, on the north um, of the Red Circle. It is even close to the town. But that's the name that evolves through the British official histories and, and, and popular usage in Britain. Um, it is the key, it's a choke point, like Suez, like Darla. Gibraltar, like the Straits of Malacca, and in in possession of this. This isn't a place where anybody comes for culture or beauty or vacation. This is a place where people come to fight. It's a place of encounter and war. Uh, Very few people have ever lived here. It was empty for a long time. What draws people to this place to fight? This is the key to the Sea of Marmara and the Bosphorus going up into the Black Sea to get to Russia. And it's been that way, the, the, the Trojan War, the ruins of Troy, are right here. Whether or not we believe in the Iliad or the Odyssey and its veracity, we can talk about that, but for sure there, was, there, was a, there were a number of wars at Troy, right here, for the control of the Guardians. Okay. <clears throat> this is how military historians and military practitioners think about strategy and operations. The strategic objective, we're going to go to the Dardanelles, occupy Constantinople, and knock the Ottoman Empire out of the war. So that's a strategic objective. How we're going to do this is to occupy the Straits, take Constantinople, break through the Dardanelles, have a fleet of about 14 older battleships and 50,000 men in the Russian war. So all you put this together, you've got about 8,000 men. So this, this is not a big deal in the total framework of the war in 1915. This is a relatively low, low investment of resources. And they're excess capacity. These are people who really don't have a way to plug in anywhere else at this particular point. And it's seductive. We can do this on the chain. Churchill pushes it. It starts off in its first iteration as a naval campaign. So there are three separate camp sub subcampaigns. Sub within what we call the Gallipoli Campaign. So at the Gallipoli Campaign, nine months long at the strategic level, not Turkey out of the war. At the operational level, three separate campaigns designed to break through the Straits. The first one is a naval campaign. We can break through the Dardanelles with ships along. 13 battleships, a few Royal, Royal, Royal Marines, and we push our way through. Cardinal. British Admiral is asked to submit a plan, and that's his plan. It's, it's a sequential operation. We're going to bombard the forts. We're going to then sweep the mines. We're going to bombard the forts again. Um, the mine sweepers go through, but it's one, two, three, four, and we're done. Uh, Churchill asked Curtin how long will it take. He said, maybe two weeks. This is in January. They're planning. What's on the other side? Well, the Turks have heavily invested in the defenses of the Dardanelles. There are belts of mines in the Straits, those lines that are, are, are perpendicular to the, to the Straits themselves are minefields, underwater mines. Uh, the little docks are forts, the coastal artillery, naval guns and erasures and forts, and then they've got houses. The red blocks, howitzers fire up and with an arching trajectory. And the, the deck armor on any ship in 1915 is, is rather thin. So, this is a multi purpose defensive arrangement. You can attack ships underwater with a mine, you can attack direct fire with 
coast artillery and you can deliver plunger fire from the houses. So this is a dangerous place here if you come in and try to push through. The British think they can do it. They have such an Anglo-Saxon sense of superiority that they, they believe that the Turks will probably have to lose some of the gunfire, they believe that the Turks can be fight, they won't be able to deliver a fire. It starts on 19 February. Hardin makes a couple of tentative actions to come in. Uh, by early March, Hardin has knocked out the forts. He's used all the other defenses. He's taken up the forts of Sinai Bahar. He's taken up the forts of Kirkia. And he's ready for this. So, so step one is pretty much done. He's going to come in. And he comes in and, and he gets pushed back. He comes in again and gets pushed back. So now we're up to about, about the 12. Harden at that point, 15 March, 12 to 15 March, is a, is a mental breakdown. And it takes himself out of command. He's replaced on 17 March by John Garobin. <clears throat> Churchill says in an immediate wire, can you do what Carden said? The Roman says, sure. And on the 18th of March, off they go. This is a victory day in, in Turkey. The Turks celebrate the 18th of March. As a, as, a, as, a, as a day of victory over the West. The Australians and New Zealanders celebrate Anzac Day on the 25th. Okay, what happens? They, they start steaming in here. Within a few hours, uh, they, they've lost a few battleships. Uh, or, or, or lines of ships are coming in here and they start to turn around so other ships can come in to replace them. And they hit a parallel line. All minefields have been laid perpendicular to the current, except for this one. And it's laid that way because the Turks notice when every time Cardin's guys come in, they always turn it off to the right. The British don't know this is there. They, they lose three or four ships at this point. <clears throat> three three battleships are sunk, three are heavily damaged. Battle cruisers have been damaged. This is a big deal. There's only 12 of these things out there to begin with. So, so, so we're, 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 we're looking at massive casualties relative to the size of the force. Um, ships alone don't, and they, they, they quickly realize. The robot goes back, uh, he's got plenty of ammunition. Churchill sends him a wire, which is sending more ships to replace the ones that you lost. Can you go again? And the robot says, sure. Somewhere between 18 March and the 22nd of March, the robot decides he doesn't have the forces to do it. And he's going to need land forces to take the forts on the peninsula. So this is the ending of the first campaign, in a sense. This is the ending of the ship of, by ships alone campaign. Uh, it's an amphibious campaign. We live in an era where you're, you are not the you start with, but, but back in high school and perhaps in college, if you were history major, you saw the iconic photos of uh, D Day in Okinawa and Iwo Jima. You may have seen the movie Saving Private Ryan. So we live in an era where amphibious assault from the sea is doable. We think it's possible. That, that wasn't true in 19. The common wisdom on the street, where you see knowledge on the street, was ships can't fight forts. And what they saw in the Straits on 18 March seemed to reinforce that. But the British, being British, thought they could persevere. They got the Royal Marines, they got the British Army, they got the British Navy, and somehow we can put this thing together and we can land troops on the beach. It's never been done like this. Never been done. A lot of troops previously have been landed somewhere other than, than under the fire. And then, then Move to the point of contact. So this is a new. There's no doubt. There's no training. There's no books you could pick up and read. If you want to fight a counterinsurgency today, you could pick up the Army counterinsurgency manual written by David Petraeus and his gang and look through it. Too. Like, this is a place to start. They don't have that. So same same objective, but a different set of ends ways and means. I'll show you the map just a second. We're going to flip the hard plans up. We still intend to break through, but not by ships alone. We're slugging soldiers. 
sees that the that the dominate the force from the river. We're adding a substantial amount of people to this. Fifty thousand now from seventy thousand. And and there are French in there, and there are Australians and New Zealanders. So this is called a joint and combined operation. It's ships and men, and it's also the forces of, of different countries. There's the Cliff Bahar Plateau. The Red Star is about the force. So, when we stand on the Cliff Bahar Plateau, we are looking down into the force. So, you have the high ground. You have the tactical opportunity presented by the possession of the high ground. So, if you get the Cliff Bahar Plateau, nobody can survive in the force. Because your artillery up there, that then stops the direct fire. Your minesweepers can come in and sweep up the mines and off to you go. So that that that, that is that is what what's the campaign is all about. Okay, what do the Turks have? Well, they've got these people, the Fifth Army. Mustafa Kemal commands the 19th Infantry Division. The two divisions that are in contact on the 25th of April are these two, the 9th Infantry. Mustafa Kamal's. They work for a guy named Esad Pasha, a corps commander, who works for a German officer. So Lehman von Sanders is the, 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 the commander of the Ottoman Fifth Army. He's been there, he's been there for 29 days. So his, his total opportunity to examine this and change things in 29 days is minimal. So he, he, he rolls in, he essentially inherits a Turkish plan, and he fine tunes it a little bit. He, he moves people into reserve positions to uh, uh, launch counterattacks in a little different manner than the Turks have done previously, but, but it, it doesn't change the defensive arrangement very much. A lot of these folks are in different places other than where the British lands. In the 7th Infantry, the 11th Infantry, the 5th Infantry, they're all in places where they won't be hit initially. There's Mustafa Kemal's division, the red rectangle, the 19th Infantry Division. It's in reserve. You'll notice these other divisions all, all defend the coastline, all have beachfront property, if you will. Mustafa Kemal is in the rear. His job is to reinforce the threatened point of attack. Uh, this plan goes back to 1912. It's an old plan that they've refined and rehearsed. They've been occupying the ground since August 1914. They, they have trained their men relentlessly. They've walked the ground. They've talked about what's going to happen. The infantry guys have, have talked to the artillery guys and said and things like, I need fire right here. How will we do it? So they're very well trained. I'll talk about this in just a brief. At the tactical level, down there at the soldier level, um, the British and the seas have played the hard plateau. They, Ian Hamilton, the British commander, has to do this somehow. How am I going to do it? Do I land everybody at once? Do I land where I spread them out? Do I do them in sequence? And he comes up with an idea of an amphibious maneuver from the sea. He's going to deceive the United States. And I'll show this in just a second uh, with his joint and combined force of, of 70,000 guys. The 70,000 guys, there are 36 days to plan this one. One of the most remarkable things that the British do um, is with, with, with no preparation, with no training, with no doctor, with no training manual, is, is to organize 70,000 people, contract ships in Egypt, and all of them training, load them on ships, get them ready for an amphibious invasion. It's, it's, it's a remarkable achievement. That's what it looks like. There are things called the principles of war. Mass. Maneuver, objective, simplicity. That violates simplicity. It's very, very complex. All these moving pieces. Um, Lee Von Sanders, or uh, Ian, Ian Hamilton, comes up with this idea. And, and, and he's not, he, he's, he's thought to be the most experienced professional soldier in Europe in 1914. He's thought to be the man. He's written books on future war. He's written poetry. He was an observer in the Russo-Japanese War. He wrote a book on the Russo-Japanese War. He writes poetry. He's been recommended for the Victoria Cross after having his left arm 
shattered against the wars under Judah Hill. This, he's quite, he's not, he's, he's no second grade guy. Um, but he, he, he wants the French to, to launch a uh, diversionary landing here. He wants the Royal Naval Division way up there on the top to do a diversion in Sarvis Bay. But what he's trying to do is, is, is to confuse the defenders. There, make them unsure as, 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 to, as to where the Allies are actually going to land. What happens then is they can't commit reserves. So he thinks he's got a 40 hour window to play with it if he can execute this properly before even von Sanders will start to move the reserves. If he can win this thing, get a foothold, get his primary, his intermediate objectives at, at the end of 48 hours, he's well positioned to win the campaign. Uh, very complex. The, the two serious landings. At the tip of the peninsula, it's at El Bahar, and then at Gabatepe, in the middle of the peninsula, with the Australians and the New Zealanders. That's what his force looks like. He's going to land at the main effort at the tip of the peninsula, the 29th Infantry Division. These are British regulars. These are the only people in this mess of, of outfits that he thinks he can count on. They're professional, long service British regulars. They will wear red coats 200 years ago. Now they were khaki. But these are the guys he knows he can count on. The Australians and New Zealanders are mostly citizen soldiers. The French, he's not quite sure on uh, in any case. The Royal Naval Division are sailors uh, in, in army uniforms with no artillery. So his confidence band is as strong as with, with Hunter Weston is 29th That 29th Infantry Division will land here at the peninsula. And within the first 40 hours, they want to be in a place called Achiba. It's the high ground on the way to the Kulib Bahar Plateau. The Australians have a supporting effort landing at Anzac Beach. They'll seize the Malta. So, in the first 48 hours, according to the plan, this is what will happen. We are positioned here, and we brought the French in to help us, and we cut off the peninsula. Once that happens, in the next day or two, we take the Kulib Bahar Plateau. We do that, we, we won the campaign. Uh, he believes he has a 48 hour window. He thinks naval gunfire can replace artillery. This is a long story, I won't get into it. Um, he, his memoirs, if you read the Ian Hamilton's memoirs, there's a ratio for it. One, one of us is worth ten of them. Um, it's about his utmost center thinking as you possibly can get. Uh, and and the, the, the islands, even though they're in trenches, will, will receive a volley of fire and shoot back once, but then they'll collapse. So he has a lot of assumptions at the tactical level, just like British planners do at the strategic level. So one assumption, one assumption, one assumption, they're all cumulative. If, if, if they fail together, you've got huge problems. These are the beaches. <laughs> The two that are most violent are B Beach and W Beach. Uh, long story here. Uh, these are tiny beaches. They're, they're not much bigger than twice the size of this room. They're not like the beaches at, at, at Normandy. They're not like the beaches at, at, at Sicily or Salerno in Italy. So they're, they're very small beaches. This is the most famous B Beach. It's not a football field wide. There it is. Um, you can see projecting into the water the remnants of a quay that was built by the British in 1915. One of the most interesting things about this battle at the tactical level is, is the river climb. They didn't have landing craft. They get a special purpose landing craft. The bow ramps drop and the Marines come out, or, or the bow ramps drop and the tanks drive out. They don't have those. So, so the men come ashore in the most, most part they, 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 in, in rowboats. Towed in by the steam launch at about 300 yards offshore. The steam launch disconnects them and they row in. So it's very slow. So one of the guys on, on, on naval staff says, You know, if we, we get a ship, kind of a throwaway ship, a colleague named the River Clyde, uh, we, can, we can cut holes in the sides and we can put machine guns up in the bottle with sandbags and we'll just take that ship and ram it into the shore very quickly and then 2,000 men. Will, will disembark. Um, they don't quite make it to shore. They don't have good maritime survey maps. 
so it grounds out early. Um, the bow ramps are supposed to disembark on land, but they don't. So it's a mess. It's a mess. This is out of 2009, within hours of thousands of casualties. So this is, this is a horrible thing, but it's innovation. If you don't know how to do something, if you've never done it before, where would you start? So one of the things the British know, this is a, a coming to our <coughs> campaign of innovation, um, landing craft, how to, do, um, how to spot naval gunfire, maps with grids like you see in the U.S. topographic maps, don't exist. So, so that's all new technology, great technology, but grids on maps. They're inventing that as they go. So huge innovation. Anzac. Um, 25 April, Anzac Day. They're supposed to land here on, on Brighton, what the hell, Z Beach, or what they named Brighton Beach. For a variety of reasons, they don't. They get kind of offset, and they land in a tiny little cove up there called Anzac, they call it the Anzac Cove. Um, and off they go. That, that's where they land. 36,000 people are going to come across that beach. Um, and once they get there, they're going to climb up this rugged terrain. So, so this is an enormously difficult thing to do. Not only are they in the wrong place, but what they've got, they're on this little tiny beach, and, and there are Turks at the top with guns. And that's bad juju for anybody trying to come up this hill. Um, that's what happens in Anzac. They're, they're supposed to be at the, at the end of end of the first day, they're supposed to be here at that line. At the end of the first day, they're where the blue is, and then they're almost ready to quit. This is where Mustafa Kamal's guys, the 19th Division, comes in with Galil's, Galil Sandy's guys in the 9th Division and stop this attack cold. Okay, what happens? It doesn't go as they expect. Plans don't survive first contact. It's not quick, it's not easy, it's not rapid. Now, after a week or two, they're stuck in trench warfare here on the Dardanelles, just like they were in France. But they sought to avoid by moving here, they got the same gun in. And they misunderstand the reasons for failure. They, they think, well, we don't have enough artillery. Our artillery shells aren't very good. The, the, uh, the, the Turks outnumber us. In fact, the Turks at the point of contact are, are, are in the inferior position. So, this is that Dr. Phil thing. How's that working for you? you know, the war council up in London expects a victory. It doesn't happen. So now we went to May and, and, and they reinforce a little bit. They, now we're in the June and the war council has some decisions to make because Ian Hamilton's force is getting weaker and weaker and weaker. So what happens is they decide to reinforce the effort. This is, this is kind of like Gambling, throwing good money after bad, sunk costs. You're at that slot machine and you put in 20 bucks worth of quarters or whatever, and, and just one more will, 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 will win the pot. That happens to, to planners in government and it happens to planners in the military. Sunk costs. So they decide to reinforce Hamilton and give him a free plan, a free hand to do another campaign. So this is the third campaign. So the first campaign was, was all naval ships. The second campaign, an amphibious operation. The third campaign is a land operation with a supporting amphibious move. So it's, it's a, a yet a third different type of campaign. There we go. The end is the same. So what we see in this are, are, are three different ways and means to achieve the same end. We're going to break through the Dardanelles. We're going to do this in reverse. We're going to seize the Maltepe and isolate the Fifth Army. And we're going to give Hamilton five more divisions. So now Hamilton, by this time, is up to 13 Army divisions. It's a significant force. Okay. Sometimes people call this suitable back. There is an amphibious component. The Ninth Corps is going to come in on the Anzac left flank to guard the left flank. Um, some people call this suitable bay. The proper name is the Anzac Bay. So here we are on 6th August, 7th August, 1915. The British
British and French down here at the tip of the peninsula. They've been fighting now for since, since August, since April 25th. The ANZAC, the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, is up there. They haven't moved at all. So here's the plan. The 29th Division will launch a diversionary attack to try to confuse the Turks down here. The Australians will launch a diversionary attack at Lone Pine and, and, and try to deceive the Turks as to what's happening. Immediately after that, they'll launch the Anzac breakup. This, this is this is a, a flanking maneuver coming up this terribly high hill um, that, that's about 1,500 feet tall from the sea level. Uh, at the same time that happens, the Ninth Corps comes in and secures a supporting position. So it's very complicated. All this is going to happen within the 12-hour period. On uh, the, the two little arrows I just right here. This is the famous issue. If you see the Mel Gibson movie, the look, it's all about an attack on a place called the Neck. The Neck is a, a, a little saddle in between two hill masses, and it's about as wide as this room, and it's flat. And on the other side of it are Turks with machine guns. The Mel Gibson movie portrays it. Uh, that. The attack on the Neck. There are supposed to be supporting guys coming out of the attack, the main attack on the top of the hill to help them. That never happens. So that's why that thing goes awry. So all these moving pieces of parts, um, all in dark. This is, this is before my vision goggles, um, before, before anything like that. They don't have good maps. It's dark and things go awry. What has to happen then is they seize Malta. Now, they haven't got quite to the Cliff of the Hard Plateau yet, but as, as we go along, as practicable is the phrase that these guys are using, we will at some point need to undertake Malta. So, this is the third variant, the third campaign to seize this critically high ground. Um, they never make it, they never make it to the top of Hill 971. Right there at that arrow, the flanking arrow, the curve arrow, that's 971. They get up there briefly, they're pushed back. So that's as far as they get. Okay, what happens? Again, rapid, they expect a rapid victory, it doesn't, it doesn't materialize. Stalemate sets in. They misunderstand the reasons for failure, they blame it on the commanders. Um, it's a night operation, it's unreversed, they got bad maps, that stuff is are, are all all parts of this too. Ian Hamilton is really is relieved. They fire him. You know, the football team moves because you fire the coach, so that's what happens to Ian Hamilton. The war council decides to abandon the effort. Westerners prevail over Easterners. There is a schism in the British War Council. The Westerners want to attack the West Front against Germany. Easterners want a peripheral campaign against what they call knocking out the props. Hit the Ottoman Empire, hit the Austrian Bulgarians, take out the weak pieces, and at that point, Germany will collapse. So this, 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 this move against the Ottomans, supported by the people they call the Easterners, now fails. And the result is Britain throws her entire weight into the Western Front. Okay, what do I talk about? Why did why the Ottomans? How do they win this? Obviously, they won. Well, let me, for Americans, I talk about Gettysburg, a great campaign done in Pennsylvania during our Civil War. There are three historical narratives on Gettysburg. The, the first eight years of the historiography, Lee loses. Robert E. Lee loses that campaign because, because his subordinates fail him. Subordinates. Uh, Longstreet, uh, Ewell, Jeff Stewart do the wrong things. The next 50 years of the historiography is, is Lee fails his subordinates. They don't do well because Lee doesn't give them good orders or orders they misunderstand. The latest historiography says Lee lost because George Meade, the federal commander, did some very important things to win that, that battle. So, how do we explain the Ottoman um, victory? I explain it with command and control. That British command and control 
is not as good as autonomous command and control. What is command and control? Command is all about decisions. There's a commander and he's making decisions and he's a leader and he does uniform, all that, but he's a general. But the essence of that is how he makes decisions. What kind of information he takes into consideration? What's his situational awareness? What, what, what does he think is happening? And control, how he controls the battle, how he influences or executes the battle as, as, as it progresses. So two parts to this, making decisions and then influencing the outcome of your decisions. The odds work better. How do I come up with this? That book compares commander to commander. So you can compare by looking at the war diaries, the Ottoman war diaries, the British war diaries of, of William von Sanders and Ian Hamilton, and look at the decisions they made, and then how they how they execute or influence those decisions. Ian Hamilton doesn't do anything, literally, uh, all day. He's floating. He's, he's in a battleship uh, with, with the robot. His only decision he makes is to the Anzac. That, same state, you know, I'm not going to pull you off. You got to stay in there. Bob Sanders does some very creative things. Um, goes to the point of contact. He orders reinforcements. Remember that Ian Hamilton is planned on 48 hours before even Bob Sanders will be able to figure out what's going on. Uh, by 12 o'clock, he's, he's ordering reinforcements to the peninsula. Um, by 1500, he's ordering a second regiment to the peninsula. Uh, at 1.50 in the morning of 26 April. So now we are 19 hours into the fight, and the unit of Sanders is suddenly, he's, he's got five divisions all together. Two around the peninsula in, in contact. He's now sending two of the others. So instead of 48 hours, he's, he's, he's moving people at 18 hours. That, that kills Hamilton's <coughs> Hamilton doesn't do much of anything. To withdraw, he says, "I'll stay a bit longer." Um, so we, we can compare decision versus decision at the tactical level. We can compare core command against core commander. Hassan Pasha is the third core command, and he's opposed by William Birdwood, the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps commander. We know Hassan Pasha at 1400, at two in the afternoon, is, is on the battlefield looking at, at things. Birdwood, Birdwood comes ashore at 15, at 3 o'clock uh, and leaves, makes no decisions at all. That's not, Pasha gives Mustafa Kamal control, battlefield control, and, and, and what we call uh, task organizes his forces and gives him control of the battle space and gives him a regiment from the 9th Division. It's a critical step. Um, that's what we call chopping the 27th Regiment to Kamal. And by, at, 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 at 5 o'clock the next morning, he's coordinating those reinforcements that are coming in that the Queen von Sanders had set to move back at 1.50 in the morning. Bergman does not. Um, he even, even at 10 p.m. In the, in the evening, when Bergman's subordinates say, hey boss, this is really, we're in trouble, we got to leave. Uh, we'd, like, we'd like you to pull us off this death trap or a beachhead we're trapped in. Bergman says, I'm not so sure. All of Hamilton side. So, so the, the, that's what I've kind of done in this book is just go over and over these decisions. What do I find? It? It's, it's all about information. The Ottomans know what's going on to a degree that, that the British don't. The Ottoman reporting system is a German reporting system that pushes information up. The British information system is, is antique. And, you know, and if a general wants to know something, he, he sends a message down to his subordinate saying, Tell me what's going on. <laughs> so, so Ian Hamilton is always, always just a step or two behind William Von Sanders. Uh, there's unity of command on the Ottoman side. If they're using the German doctrine that the, the Turks have been using since 1880. They have a command climber of initiative and opportunity. The, the Turkish officers, when they see an opportunity, are authorized to take advantage of it. My mission says take this hill, but, but if, if, if I can take the second hill uh, and get deeper into enemy territory, I'll do that. So, so this is a Germanic, we call it Aufstrahlung tactic, mission command. The Turks do this, not to the degree the Germans do, but they do it to a degree that's better than, than the British. Uh, 
a doctrinal uniformity. The British are kind of trapped in a, a system of, it's archaic, it belongs in the 19th century. It's a regimental army. The British, the artillery doesn't talk to the infantry, and they're, they're very compartmentalized. So they've got, they've got a, a terrible reporting system with a compartmentalized army in, 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 a, in a situation that, uh, there's a huge literature on command and control in the British Army. I'm a Martin Samuels advocate, I believe they, they're, they're the best to, is to describe by restrictive control. Um, they have a mission, they're, they're left to do it, uh, but nobody ever asks them how, how it's going, and there's no opportunity down at the lowest level to do something else that may get it done quicker and faster. Uh, this gives the Ottoman more enhanced situational awareness. Risk and gambles in, in military affairs, military history, uh, tend, tend, to be, tend to be based on the information that people have at the moment. Uh, and and the, the Turks, the Ottomans, have better information. It, 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 may, it enables them to mass forces of the, you know, what does this get them? Well, they can, they can get inside the enemy's decisions. They can move faster and quicker. The great American cavalry leaders in the Civil War uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest has a quote, get their firstest with the mostest. Get their firstest with the mostest. Um, the Turks can do that. They, they can get people there quicker. Enough people, enough people to stop the British. The commanders are also able to intervene and influence operations. When the British start operations on cruise control, it's on automatic pilot, they, they go, there's no way they can turn it off or, or, or change the, the Turks and the Germans have a system where they intervene and, and, and make a mid-course correction. The British can't do that. Okay. Command and control. There it is. Um, make better decisions. <coughs> because they have timely and accurate information and situational awareness. They can, they can intervene at the operational level. They can actually, actually influence the operation as it's happening. Okay. Conclusions of the book. Pretty, pretty much there it is. Both of the British book, Ottoman Army generated significantly higher levels of effective command control. Um, I, I try to use the word effective rather than better. The Germans were better than the British in World War II, but better is not quantifiable. If you say the Germans were more effective than the German the British in World War II, then, 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 you, then, then you can quantify it. You say, how do you mean? Do you mean in, in volume of firepower? Do you mean in, in the speed of operations? Do you mean in, in the, the rapidity of, of, uh, of movement? So, so that, that's one of the things that I focus on. I do like British military history a lot. This guy is not popular in the United States by any means, but I'm quite an admirer of him. Bernard Montgomery, uh, who's a British field marshal, Famous for being prickly and a jerk and egocentric and, and a stickler for detail. Uh, the Americans don't like him in World War II. He, he, he works for Eisenhower. Uh, and, and Patton and Bradley are his counterparts. Um, but he uses his term grip. If, if you read Montgomery's guidance to his subordinates in World War II, he talks about grip. He talks about the ability of a commander to somehow exercise grip on the operation. Uh, it's not a doctrinal term. You won't find this word in, in military training manuals or doctrinal manuals. You'll find grip as it is, it is an emotional, how the commander manages to, to, to decide and, and, and make the battle conform to his ideas rather than to let the enemy run, run the show or, or let the battle force you into making bad decisions. Uh, my view is that on the Gallipoli Peninsula, this lack of grip is what doomed the British the Ottomans have grip, the commanders are in charge, they make the battle conform to their wishes, the British are unable to do this. In fairness to the British, they're going to catch up to the Turks and the Germans. By 1917, they, they've caught up to the Turks and gone past them. By 1918, they've caught, caught up and gone past the Germans. So by 1918, the most tactically adept army in the world is the British Expeditionary Force in France. They understand technology, they understand organization, they understand tactics to a degree nobody else does. So, so the British are, are, are slow to come to speed, but when they get it, they, they, they get it. Okay. 
So that's it. Ottomans feel about having a German commander? And how did that Mustafa Kemal didn't like it. 
<laughs> Very few do. And starting in 1880, the, the Sultan asks the, the Germans to send on a military training mission. This is what we've tried to do in Iraq since 2003, and then we stopped in 2010, and now we're back on again. Uh, it, 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 it takes more than a few years to train an army. So the Germans start to come down starting in, 19, uh, in, in 1880. Uh, so by, by 1915, they've been there for 35 years. Um, the, the top ranked Ottoman commanders have gone to the War College, which is a mirror image of the German War College. The, um, they, they, they have exchange assignments with, with, with units in Germany. Um, in World War I, in addition to that military training mission that's there, the, they'll send down a few more guys, but the military training mission converts to um, a command structure that they plug in into the Ottoman divisions and corps and armies. So for example, the 5th Army, the William von Sanders commands, is the only one of, of seven number armies at this time of the war that has a German command. Um, they're, they're interchangeable. The, one, of the, one of the remarkable things about, about the Germans and the, and the, and the Ottomans is, is the interoperability factor. You can, you can plug it in a, a, a German into the Ottoman command structure because they're using the same doctrine, the same methods, the same techniques, um, they're on the same sheet of music. But one of the problems is none of, none of the Germans speak Ottoman Turkish. Most of the Ottoman high-ranking officers speak either German, French, or Russian. So they, they do manage to communicate. Um, the Ottomans don't like it. They don't like the idea that, that the Germans are coming down and, and trying to, to, to run their war. That, that's, that's the common feeling. Lehman von Sanders, up until the Gallipoli campaign, is marginalized. Uh, they don't feed him information up until he takes command of the Fifth Army. Uh, he will go on. He'll spend the war later on down in Palestine. But it's, it's, a, it's a recurring problem. But overall, overall, it works very good. Overall, it's a good relationship. Once Serbia falls and they break, they, they, they actually make a connection from Germany to, to Turkey, the, the Germans will send on artillery, aircraft units, communications units, locomotives, um, stormtrooper um, helmets and things on them, uh, machine guns. So what, that, that's, that's the, the, the Germans' primary contribution is beyond the, this hand, handful of officers is the material support that they send on to the Allies. That's a good question. How big was there the support? The support that you mentioned just now, the, 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 the Germans, Germans game, how big was it? Yeah, I, well, in, in 1914, it's, it's 87 people. At, at this time, with this, uh, 1915, it's, it's about 1,000. Uh, it will grow to a maximum of 20,000 by the end of the war. Um, most, most of them are, are what we call service support. They, they, they are infantry. So the Ottomans have plenty of infantry. Lots and lots of guys are right. What they don't have are signals units, communications, or heavy artillery, um, aircraft units. So, so the, the Germans have come down medical units, uh, transportation trucks. So the, the Germans that come down tend to be what we call combat multipliers. They take a base unit of Ottoman uh, infantry and then they transform it with artillery, machine guns, trucks, aircraft into something that, that can compete with the British. So that's their primary contribution.
and they're, they're trying to make a goal that begins to work with advanced techno technological empires and countries in the world. They're fighting the British and the French, and even the Russians are more advanced technologically than the Ottomans are. So, so we're good at that. trying to overcome that. Um, the Germans helped them to some extent, but, but as we go through the war, um, they're, they're ground down. And when they lose artillery, they lose aircraft, they can't replace it. The British are increasing production up, in, up until the end of the war. So when the British lose an artillery piece in Palestine, two more come down to replace it. It's that, that kind of a war. So it's, a, it's an attritional war uh, that eventually the, the Ottomans lose primarily because of attrition. Um, the remarkable thing is that they hold on as long as they do. The, the Russian army collapses because of the Russian Revolution. Um, the French army mutinies in 1917. The German fleet mutinies in 1918. Uh, Romania collapses. Um, Italy comes this close to collapse in, in early 1918. Um, the remarkable thing is that, that in spite of all these liabilities, the Ottoman Empire just keeps on going. They're like the energizer money. They just they keep on fighting. And it isn't until, until the end of October 1918 that, that they finally quit. Um, it's a remarkable story. Uh, their casualties are, are, are higher than the French, so they have enormous casualties. Uh, but yet they keep on fighting. I can't explain that. Um, why, they, why they keep on fighting? That's what they do. Okay, let's give everyone a pause. comes with a warning, you should not attempt to read this book while driving or walking. <laughs> <laughs> what about Lee? Do you have a flight? No problem.